Okay. So for the purposes of time, I think we are going to go straight to um, the reason for what we are going to do today. So um, this actually stems from the SUSTAC um, needs assessment, where we um, did a global needs assessment on systems thinking in practice and whether people apply them or not, and what are the barriers or the opportunities to do so. And in fact, what are the uh, understandings around systems thinking? Thinking. And from this, we realized there were some gaps, which I'm going to share some with you. And then we realized there were a series of things we can do to engage people across various continents. But particularly for me, I'm leading the African um, hub in terms of promoting systems thinking. So this meeting is very, very important to us and to everybody. And then it's also important that we join in the um, teaching and learning thematic working group for health systems global, which is also um, associated with the Alliance for Health, in that some of the issues around capacity building, training people uh, to be able to do uh, apply systems thinking would be related to things around teaching, training, and capacity building. So that is the essence of why we are having this joint um, webinar. I'm going to allow my colleague, um, um, uh, Dintley, in a moment to um, talk to you to introduce the speakers. But before then, I want to share the agenda with you, which is the activities that we'll be doing now. Uh, at the moment, we are doing the welcomes and the introductions. Um, then we'll be getting some presentation from uh, Ayat, Dr. Abugula, <laughs> who would uh, who would tell us about um, the Health Systems Global Thematic Working Group on Teaching and Learning. We are also going, I'm going to also do a presentation on the results from the needs assessment, particularly in terms of uh, results relating to the politics of systems uh, uh, development, health systems development. And then there will be a poll at the same time as my uh, presentation um, or during the panel discussion. And then we are going to have a panel discussion from experts in the field from very, who are sitting at different levels of the health system, hoping to share their experience. This is practical experience sharing around the issues of how politics and power uh, relations and power play play out within a health system. And then we are going to have a Q&A and then also um, discussions and take home messages, uh, which will inform our next activity over the next coming um, months or probably years. Mm -hmm. So um, just some, um, some basic rules, housekeeping rules. Just if you're online, please kindly put yourself on mute um, so that we don't have any issues with um, noises from background noises. If you want to speak, you can also um, indicate that by raising your hand, we'll take notice of you. The chat box will be available for a lot of the discussions going on. Please feel free to put them in. We'll spend time to read your messages. And then also, um, I guess that's all. So I'll hand over to Dintley to introduce our speakers. Going back. Great, thank you very much, Gina. We, we are very excited to have all of you um, in the room this afternoon. Um, let me welcome all of you. Uh, my name is Dean Lemulusiwa, as Gina has indicated. Uh, I am speaking to you this afternoon from Khaborone, Botswana, uh, where I also work with the University of Botswana as a lecturer in the Faculty of Medicine, uh, the Department of Family Medicine and Public Health. Um, so I'm going to be working with Gina and, and the rest of you really, um, because this afternoon we really, it's really about engagement, it's about interacting with yourselves. Um, but amongst ourselves as part of our panelists, people that will really be speaking to us from their you know, depth of experience um, by virtue of what they do on a daily basis, we have um, as part of our speakers or our panelists, uh, Dr. Samuel Kaba. Doc, I'm afraid to, to, to pronounce the other one um, and, and, and will comfortably speak to this too, who is the director of ICD in Ghana Health Services. He is one of the people that will be talking to us this afternoon. Um, he will tell us a little bit more about himself when the time comes for him to speak so that we also appreciate 
the specific context from which he will be engaging with us this afternoon. We also have uh, one of my colleagues, um, Dr. Christopher Chembe, who is a public health specialist here in Botswana, but living and working in the Southern district um, of this great nation, who will also be with us and drawing from his experiences in that regard. We also have as part of our panelists that will be engaging with us, um, Dr. Lee, who is a senior HIV advisor with the Global Fund. She will also be able to speak to us uh, this afternoon. Um, we are hopefully expecting um, other um, speakers to join us even as we continue at the moment. We hope uh, that Honorable Michael Amwateng who is a senior assistant clerk at the Parliamentary Select Committee in Ghana, will also be able to join us. But we do appreciate the uh, dynamics of the office from which he works. Um, we do have an apology from um, Dr. Amel, who was also scheduled to join us this afternoon. So uh, those are the people that we are expecting to hear from. And so back to you, Gina, over. All right, thank you very much. Um, Ayat, can you kindly go ahead? Do you want to share your slides or do you want me to do that for you? On uh, our agenda, you our next agenda is to do the presentation for the teaching and learning thematic working group. Yes, uh, can either you or Dintley do that? Thank you. Okay. Uh, and while you're doing that, I'd like to welcome our participants for today. Uh, my name is uh, Ayata Bo Agla. I co-chair the Health Systems Global Thematic Working Group on Teaching and Learning. Thank you. My slides are up. Much appreciated. Uh, and I'd like to give you a glimpse of what we do in uh, the Thematic Working Group on Teaching and Learning. So our um, next slide, please. Yes, the thematic working group is organized around ways to improve the teaching and learning of health policies and systems research. And as this is a period of growth of the field of HPSR with innovations and new development in a wide variety of HPSR methods and application, there is indeed a pressing need to better define the field of HPSR and improve the capabilities of teaching institutions and tutors to teach and apply HPSR and to keep up with these new developments. So, there's also an increasing demand for qualified health policy and systems research teachers, trainers, practitioners by governments, public health, clinical and other organizations, stakeholders in the health system, as we see evident in our day-to-day -day life and as changes arise. And there has been dramatic changes in the learning technologies available to teach and assess, especially in the past couple of years, uh, forcing educational organization and forcing us to rethink how we teach, how we train, and build capacities, as well as why we teach the way we do. And uh, that's uh, intimately linked to the strategic roles of education in the development of health systems. Furthermore, there's an evident gap in the teaching and the capacity building research in the field of health policy and system research, which requires the attention that we propose within our thematic working group. Within the TWG, we aim to focus on teaching and learning methods of health policy and systems research to offer the spaces where these issues can be discussed. Uh, and to, yes, thank you, um, to emphasize on the teaching materials, the tools shares, the ability uh, to research, network, and collaborate with those involved in educational missions of teaching and learning in HPSR. In this thematic group, we aim to continue providing the networking and the support to those involved in the educational mission, as well as create a platform to build the field. We aim to support and adapt new methods of teaching and building to collaborate and share their information. And that's why we call on all the participants and the networks within SysTAC, uh, our colleagues and anyone who will be hearing this um, webinar to indeed join our HSG thematic working group in teaching and learning and 
emphasis on strengthening it in LMICs, where there's a critical lack of capacity in many LMIC institutions, which hampers embedding research and program evaluation in the policy processes and retention of young and promising researchers, especially in problematic and undermines country capacity. And hopefully during the course of this webinar, we'll be hearing a lot from our esteemed colleagues and see how we can tackle, manage, express and share their experience experiences within the field. Next slide, please. Uh, so with that, I'd like to welcome you all to join us through these links and uh, hopefully learn more about what we're doing and be part of the bigger society and the thematic working group and engage with uh, different um, people from different regions, which we all share different, uh, the main aim and goal and interest in health policy and systems research. Next slide, please. And please do uh, join us in Bogota for our HSR 2022 uh, Health Systems Research Symposia. So please do visit the website. Uh, this is the web page. You can see the link here. Uh, I encourage you all to join. Um, there's still the deadlines for organized and individual abstract submissions are still open. So please do join. And uh, over to you, Gina and Antel, and uh, welcome. And uh, uh, let's hope a fruitful and productive discussion. Thank you. Over Thank to you. you. Thank you, Ayat. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I think we, because of time, we are going to move straight into the presentation I'm going to make with regards to the research that I mentioned earlier, which is to look at the, um, um, hold on a second, I'm trying to find my presentation. Okay, I think I found it. To look at the results on politics regarding um, the systemic needs assessment within the African region. So for the sake of bandwidth, I'm going to put my camera off. And um, I hope most of you have seen me. I'm going to wave at you, if you can see my hand. Um, and I'm going to put my camera off. So yet again, my name is Dr. Gina Teddy. Um, I'm speaking to you from Accra, Ghana this afternoon. And um, I am until recently the coordinator for the Center for Health Systems and Policy Research. And I do also run a lot of uh, MPH programs. Um, looking at training and teaching of health leaders and managers and practitioners. I do engage in a lot of things, advocacy, um, and I'm quite passionate about health system. But at the moment, my role here is as the lead for Sustat Africa. So all of these are important to understand the, the different dynamics in terms of how we can develop health systems in low middle income countries. So my uh, presentation is entitled, The Politics of Engaging Stakeholders to Improve Health Systems. Some highlights from the that needs assessment. This will be the outline of the presentation. What do, what do you, uh, what do we mean by SOSTAC? Just to give you a brief background of it, um, SOSTAC is the short, um, term for Systems Thinking Accelerator, which is an alliance project to uh, improve systems thinking and increase the use of systems thinking for practitioners and then in practice. And practitioners could, uh, does not mean only those who are on the field um, actually providing services, but anybody who finds it, it themselves interfacing between policies and then the public. So we are looking at how we can strengthen that, but also how we can bridge the gap between decision makers, practitioners, and researchers. And then also the main objective is to um, improve or focus on the application of systems thinking in health, and then to ensure SysTAC aligns its capacity strengthening opportunities uh, to the various activities that people do. So yet again, to enable us to do this, we are creating different platforms, communities of practitioners, decision makers, so that people can engage and then these will bridge. The needs assessment, however, had multiple objectives that we did. And this was not only done in Africa, um, it was done across the different regions of the globe. Um, and here we had 
as one of it is to understand access needs and demand for system thinking, the barriers and opportunities to apply them, uh, capacity building needs for people to be able to do so, and then to map out access in terms of the health systems broadly, and also whether these actors can promote systems thinking to help us to harness the resources, the limited resources that we have continuously, particularly within the continent of Africa, and then also the expertise um, and also the decision makings. Otherwise, there is always overlap. This is the methodology used, consultative workshop, stakeholder mapping, Zoom polls, and surveys. And then we, these are the countries that participated actively in all of the three methods that we used. Um, these are some of the findings. I'm rushing you through it quickly because I want us to focus on the political aspect. Um, these are some of the findings that we, uh, we got from the study that um, people broadly knew what systems thinking is. And I'm using the word loosely as broadly because people did understand systems thinking to mean, you know, and engaging with other people. But it's more or less like a buzzword at the moment within the health sector. Um, but as to whether people knew the applications of this and the tools of it is another issue, um, which we need to look up for. Um, please, can you see my slide still? Somehow I lost my slide. Can you guys see my slides? No, no we are gone now. Um... Right, okay. I'm going to try and share it again. Okay, somehow I stopped. I'm going to go back to the screen. Apologies for that. Um, okay. So I was on the findings, right. So people broadly understood what systems thinking is and it was one of the needs um, assessment that we did. did do people know what systems thinking is? But this understanding differed. Um, it differed in terms of whether the person was working within the health sector or other sectors. And this is the health systems analysis or needs assessment. So we didn't look at only the health sector, but we looked at other um, sectors that also work closely with the health system. So we realized that um, also there's a gap between practitioners and also researchers on the one hand, and then practitioners, researchers, and uh, sorry, practitioners, poly, uh, decision makers, and researchers on the other hand. In that, practitioners were very much aware this was a tool or a method or an approach that they were employing in whatever they were doing. That was the, uh, the understanding for most researchers. Unlike practitioners, some of them knew about it by virtue of their further studies in MPH or some uh, short training programs. But there are a lot of people who were using system thinking approaches and methods, but were not aware they were doing so until we started explaining what these tools meant. So that was some of the issues that we found because if you didn't understand it, then of course you couldn't apply it. Then also we realized that most of the understanding came from formal and informal training and others, um, very, very few people taught themselves because they had to take a decision that required them to apply it. In practice, we also saw gaps in practice between applying systems thinking in a day-to-day -day practice as compared to an organization promoting systems thinking approach or a systematic way of doing things. We saw this gap as well. And um, so sometimes you saw a team that was doing very well in terms of applying tools and also being systematic in the way they took decision, in the way they address problems and so on, but it didn't translate across institutions. Um, what we noticed was that these gaps were real and it, it was real because for most practitioners, they had tight deadlines. So telling them to go through a systematic approach that 
quote and unquote, would take longer was not something that most of them were uh, familiar with. And then people who had knowledge sometimes were individuals or just a few people at lower rank who could not make an impact when it came to making decisions. So even though they had the knowledge and they were willing to apply these system thinking, they couldn't because they didn't have the, need, uh, the ability to make decisions and change the way things are done. Leadership was one of the biggest things that <clears throat> kept coming up, sorry. And we realized that a lot of the leaders, even though may have ideas, had other timelines which were too strict and too demanding or too politically motivated for them to look at the long-term processes which systems thinking provides. And then also con context varied, so contextual issues also varied. Um, and also there were issues around decision making. Now, some of the things that we found was that people generally said, well, so some thinking approaches are better. They are beneficial. However, when it came to uh, the, trends, uh, the trends and then the opportunities of applying them and the challenges, this is where the power and politics comes to play very, very highly. Um, we realized that people said, in fact, people would literally said that it's too cumbersome to, for me to use it. It's too cumbersome to, for me to apply it. And somebody will tell you, look, I want to apply it, but it looks like I'm the only one talking to myself. The people are saying, what's wrong with what we've been doing all the time? Despite the fact that most of the ways that things are being done at the moment are more short-term ways of thinking and doing things. So that went on and then system thinking also uh, require teamwork, something that is very common within the health sector and in other sectors as well. But then accountability mechanisms make it difficult for them to do that. And then the informal cultures also fight against um, effective system thinking approaches as much as financial and, and resource constraint. The one outstanding um, feature or um, feedback that we got was the political timeline. Excuse me, let me take some water. We noticed that political timeline was a big issue for especially leaderships because they had, let's look at Ghana for instance, you had four years within which whatever the government in powers agenda, health agenda is needs to be implemented. I'm not, uh, people are not willing to go through systematic approaches to apply things. We need to do it now. Or we have um, a global uh, health related um, program or project funding that requires to, to do this or the funding will be retained. So these timelines are equally important for us to deliver them and deliver them now. Then also, so these are led to a lot of vertical programs and funding. And for that matter, accountability issues rather that is supposed to enable is rather creating ch uh, challenges. People kept working in their silos, not willing to collaborate so much. Um, organizational approach is not also very conducive and it needs a lot of work. Although some, some of them had the systems in place, but they are not being enforced. And then this creating working environments that creates competition among workers rather than collaboration towards the same goal as well as um, colleagues not looking into how they can maximize the opportunities and harness the resource, the limited resources from other departments to be able to achieve what they are doing. The question still remains, who are the actors? Who are they and, and how does politics or these actors support the promotion of systems thinking? In fact, in terms of actors, we saw so many different actors, as you can see here. There were so many different actors. If you start unpacking, we had multiples. As, as you unpack, we have multiples of actors. And this is when we did the um, African regional um, analysis. What we noticed, and I'm going to focus on just one uh, column of this um, uh, cube. We are going to look at how to manage those we should manage closely. We realized that although there were so many actors, we didn't need all these actors to be able to implement um, or take decisions or to strengthen. Jean, I think we are losing you. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? 
Yes, yes, we can, Dana. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. So what I was saying is that we had different actors, but in terms of the stakeholder analysis that we did, we had to prioritize these actors. And we thought that we should focus more on those that we need to manage closely, starting with the Department of Health and its agencies or Ministries of Health and their agencies. Um, we have others like the local government authorities, private sector, uh, regional funders or funders, ex uh, development funders, um, volunteers, quasi-governmental health providers, and so on and so forth. I think this list might, might differ from country to country, but broadly, these are the various actors. There are others that you just have to keep informed or keep satisfied or simply monitor them. And there are others that will be found in all over the places, especially community leaders. So all of these are ways that we need to think about how to manage actors. The politics comes in when it manifests largely when it comes to leadership at different levels, from the facility to organizational levels, to national level, to decision-making within parliamentarians or um, even the ministries of health. There are so much politics that comes to play. And I think this is the job that we want to hear the experiences of our panel speakers. But then also one thing too is that organizational structure, the culture of that organization also creates its own policies that can be an enabler or a constraining factor in terms of how we develop our systems within the continent. Also issues around power over resources and decision-making and evidence generation and utilization. We, we found that there were certain decision points. Um, these are tipping points for um, improving the health systems within our continent that we can look out for. And these are points of decision-making that we thought systems thinking can be harnessed, or uh, the, the practice of it collaborating with other sectors and other actors, funding development, uh, sustainable development activities or goals, um, uh, accountability mechanisms, organizational culture and leadership. These are areas where we think we can do a lot. Um, I'm going to end here so that we can now whet your appetite for the uh, discussion because you are going to tell us now in detail some of the issues that comes out, up in terms of the, the, the managing actors and also in terms of politics and the power play of decision-making and development of health system. So I, before I go, I want to acknowledge um, SUSTAC, which have been the funders and, um, of this project and have been supporting us to, to um, improve and you know, do this activity. The Alliance have been funding SUSTAC and then also HSG, which is Health Systems Global, for which the thematic working group is part. All of these funding, I think, is related to uh, WHO. Now, you can also contact me if you want to engage in any of the SUSTAC activities or events. We can, you can go on to the Hive and sign up, or you can contact me via WhatsApp or email, and I'll get in touch with you. So without much ado, um, I don't know, I think that's it. Thank you very much for listening and for your attention. I'm going to stop here because it's time um, and ask if there are any questions. Ayat, um, are there any questions in the chat box? Yes, indeed, Gina. Thank you, first of all, for sharing the results. Uh, I've been part of the focus group, so it was really interesting now hearing the findings. So uh, David uh, asked, of course, if he could share the slides. And Mike Jackson uh, asked if uh, his question was, I wonder why leaders think that systems thinking approach will take a long time. Uh, your thoughts on that, Gina? And uh, there's been two questions, uh, queries basically asking if the findings have been published and if you could share them. So over to you. So I guess there's a question from Mike for you. It's a rhetoric question. So from your thoughts, what do you think? Why do leaders think that systems thinking approach will take long time? Over to you, Gina. Thank you.
Gina, in case you are speaking, but your mic is muted. Thank you, Dinkley. I was speaking and laughing <laughs> away. Um, what I was saying is that since there are leaders here on, uh, online with us to discuss these issues, um, I'll let them deal with that particular question. Um, um, I'm going to quickly mention Sonam. Sonam is the one in charge of the... Um, so now, can you quickly introduce yourself or say hi to us? Um, okay. She's in charge of the uh, um, sister project. So she's actually monitoring us from Geneva, I think. Hi, Sonam. Uh, hello, Gina. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Sonam Nyangchen. Uh, I'm uh, with the Alliance for Health Policy and Systems Research and uh, working uh, like uh, uh, in terms of sister group. I have been uh, working as admin uh, for this online community of practice. Uh, thank you for joining, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Sonam. Okay, so um, yeah. I think it's the slides will be shared online um, on the sister archive. And then also, we would also try to share the slides later on. So um, there is no problem about share, sharing these slides. As, uh, I think the video, not the slides per se, the video will be shared. Um, bo hopefully both on the HSG um, website and also the sister website so that people can have them from multiple sources. What is there any other question I haven't answered, Ayat? Yes, there's one coming in now. And uh, it's uh, what's the main, uh, uh, which places and level of management of participants were involved in the study? Uh, that's from MP Tengen. And then there's another question. Uh, what's the main barriers of application of systems thinking in daily management activity? Okay, so um, I'll just speak quickly to the, um, the two issues and probably if it's not well answered through the discussion, some of these things will come up. So with this particular needs assessment, we had leaders from all over, from national level throughout, throughout to uh, practitioners in the facilities. So we have, and then we had also people from different sectors apart from health, social welfare, we had somebody from um, the police, we had um, people from NGOs, especially, we had people from the mental health authority um, and mental health unit, which is almost under the health sector. Um, we had people from across different levels um, in joining in these discussions and, and for different activities. So um, these were actually real um, concerns for them in that they think some of the people who have used it tend to use, it, especially the researchers. We, we also had academics um, from different universities. So um, it was a very interesting discussion. And I think everybody on here, apart from a few of the panelists were part of this discussion. Um, so it, that's basically how wide it was in terms of those who participated. With regards to the barriers, um, why people think this is a barrier, like I said, um, I'll allow people to, uh, the leaders to speak to it. Okay, so without much ado, can I invite the speakers to share their video so that we can see them when we um, do our discussion, the panel discussion. Is that okay for everyone? Okay. So um, I'm the one leading the panel discussion, so I guess I'm going to get on with it. Um, my first question go to Dr. Chembe. Um, I think you sit at the district level um, dealing with um, the public health broadly. Um, what in your experience in terms of engaging with frontline workers and also with community members, do you think strengthening the health system and address health systems needs at the district, think, thinking of the implications or the impact of politics and power issues that you encounter in doing this. So that's the question for you, Dr. Chembe. Thank you very much. Uh, everybody can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Can you share your video with us? My video? Yes, please. Um, okay, just a minute, one minute. Oh my goodness. 
<laughs> it's okay if you can't. Please right, introduce yourself on. briefly before you do all right, so. All right, it's coming on. Okay. <laughs> all, all right, yeah, so my name is Dr. Christopher Chembe. I'm a public health specialist in the Ministry of Health in Botswana. And my role basically is to, to, to coordinate or manage public health pro programs, which go into preventing disease and promoting health using organized efforts with an informed community. So but basically that's what I do. Now, I think this afternoon is an interesting afternoon in the sense that you are asking us to share our experiences uh, am I am I am I am I am I on? Am I get being heard? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Basically, it's experiences. Yeah. So basically, now in preventing disease and promoting health, we are talking about using organized efforts and an informed community. So basically, we have got two sets of stakeholders here. So we have the <laughs> health providers who are who have to do with organized efforts. And then those people access health or the health community members. So now let me talk about my experiences with engaging the health uh, providers. Now I'm gonna discuss this very briefly. Basically here, when you talk about health providers or frontliners, you're talking about people who provide the service. And so in this case, there has to be an organization which will effectively uh, transmit whatever we want to, to, to give to the community. And here we are looking at these uh, health providers. We are looking at what are their perceptions? What are their convictions? And that being the case, we then we look at what capacity do, they, do we have in, for them to actually uh, provide what, what, what they're providing. So my experience has been that many a times uh, there is uh, a gap in the sense that the, the, the providers may not have the convictions you're asking them to, 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 to do what they are trying to do. So you find they are having difficulties or conflicts with the kind of service they are providing. And uh, in case they do have the, 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 the buy-in you know, or so on, the, my experience has been that the capacity, what capacity do they have to take the services? So basically, when you're talking about the health providers taking the service to people, and by the way, I'm talking about preventing disease and promoting health. So how do they reach these people? So you find that normally there'll be some, some element of, of, of incapacity for them to actually do this. And, and, and this actually brings up a lot of uh, uh, questions. Let me quickly move on to the people who access the health. Now the people who access the health are community members. Now, these community members, you realize that it's very important that our first step in, in them accessing the health is through their gatekeepers. So their gatekeepers then have to be people who are convinced to have a buy-in. Their gatekeepers have to share the, 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 the same priorities and they have to have the capacity in, in, in helping us. Because a community, you know, when they're accessing health services, which have to do with prevention, you know, these people are not sick. So these people have to be convinced and have to be brought on board. And mostly, if the gatekeepers are on board, then you find that they're going to woo the, the, the community to actually access the, the, the health services. So my experience has been that sometimes the gatekeepers are, are hindrance. Let, let, let's, let's say, for instance, when I'm going to talk about, when we're, when we're mobilizing uh, the community for COVID, you find that we went and we mobilized the gatekeepers, but then we found a problem. The gatekeepers could not go to the community. And why? Because the gatekeepers felt they had no capacity. The gatekeepers told us that, you know, they didn't feel like they were, they, 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 they had what it takes to actually transmit the information so to, to the community. And so here you see us as healthcare workers or frontliners, we don't have the capacity to reach the whole community. So our take was that we're going to reach them through the gatekeepers, that is the tribal leaders, the district administrators, the politicians, and so on and so forth. And these people, having been mobilized, they couldn't get the community. And then the other thing is that, um, uh, the other thing is that you see health community members, sometimes for them to access the, the, the services, you know, they've got priorities. And since you are dealing with preventive issues, 
some community members might think, by the way, at the moment, they're not even sick. And you're talking about prevention, which might, what to think about might not even come to pass. So you find that people will not prioritize themselves to be available to be mobilized. And it's very important here to understand that for preventive health services, the community needs to internalize and take what you're calling them to participate in as their own problem. So you find that this sometimes causes a gap in the sense that sometimes it's, it's very difficult to get the community actually to, to, to avail themselves to come on board so that they can effectively access our services. So I think for now, I would like to stop here. Thank you. Thank you for that timely stopping. I was going to ask you, but I think I'll hold on for now. Um, I'm going to come to you, Dr. Kaba, if you can um, put your video on for a moment. Um, you are sitting at the, you still are the um, director for the institutional care division of the Ghana Health Service. So you sit at the national level, but you are at the moment sitting in the facility. We can see you have your scrap on. So you also have an experience of the facility. What are in your uh, experience, some of the um, issues around politics and strengthening our health system and also thinking about it in respect of how we have dealt with COVID and then other services beyond COVID. Um, if you can speak to some of these issues for us. You have- uh, thank, thank you so very much uh, to you, Dr. Teddy and team for inviting me for this important program. And uh, thanks to all the listeners for being present to listen to us. Uh, as she rightly said, my name is Dr. Kaba. Uh, I'm the director of Institutional Care Division of the Ghana Health Service. Uh, basically, uh, we superintend on clinical services within the Ghana Health Service. I've been among the leaders for the past 15 years in, our, in the health sector, and uh, I've led many programs, including um, health emergencies and clinical service emergencies and diseases of public health concern like Ebola, uh, the coronavirus we're dealing with now, and many others. Uh, but Fortunately, I'm also a consultant neurosurgeon practicing actually and a public health uh, physician. So I kind of understand these things in a way I'll try to elaborate it and actually answer one of the questions that came up. Why is it that it's so difficult to understand? The first thing we need to really comprehend is that uh, health service delivery, health system is political. If we understand that, then we understand that for us to achieve any progress, then just like any political component, there is the need to have consistency and there is the need to have commitment of the various political parties. And that has been the challenge within our system. But every political party comes with its own agenda. And depending on that, you advance in your health service delivery, for instance, if they want health insurance free for all, it happens. If they want to say, okay, we're focusing on COVID, it happens. If they say, want to build health facility, it happens. But then if somebody can say, look, I don't want to build no health facilities. I want to dedicate mine into water. That's where we go into, or electricity. That's where we go into. And then so we need to understand that most of the things that happen, whether building infrastructure, equipment, or anything, is all politically determined. Now, taking it from there. So every country has a Ministry of Health. And the Ministry of Health is actually the policy maker, but also has technical wings. And if you drill down to Ghana, for instance, in our Ministry of Health, which is the policy maker, we have the technical wings. And at the same time, we have about 26 agencies. These agencies are different. So you have regulatory agencies, you have service delivery agencies, and each agency is different from the next, depending on their priorities and what they've been set to do. So if you, if you look at the service delivery agencies, you have uh, primary care facilities, you have secondary, you have tertiary, under one agency, you have a quaternary service delivery and a different agency. And all these agencies go to the Ministry of Health expecting to have their problems solved. That is financing. Now, this brings to the next part, component, where financing actually in Africa and most African countries always creates a gap because when we have a budget ready, it doesn't actually translate into budget release. So all the time we do our program of work, you have your objectives, you have the activities you want to develop, but then 
it goes through, then it gets to parliament, it gets approved, finance looks at it and says, all right, we've approved it. But it doesn't actually mean that what has been approved is what will be released. And that brings the gap. So now comes other players, visible and in invisible, who occupy that gap. And then the struggle starts. So the health sector is kind of robust at the national level and everybody, the competition is a little bit complex and complicated. And these invisible and visible uh, actors who come in now become the donor partners and other NGOs and other big players. Now, if you take Ghana, for instance, in most of the WHO uh, agreements, we sign to, up to them. So you have that international agenda that comes. So, all right, WHO this year, this is all what all countries have decided, we agree to. Then you come to Africa, we have what Africa agenda 2063, the Africa we want. We have another thing that we agree to. Then we come to the West African side, we have Wahoo. Then Wahoo also looks at the disease of international concern, we agree to. Then you come to the political party within Ghana, where the first thing would have been our national agenda that we have to agree to that this is the agenda we all need to move forward. Then from the national agenda, you have the political parties, their own agenda, their manifesto. And when a political party comes on, the first thing he wants is to achieve what he told you he wants to achieve and the reason why you voted for him. So if health is not, uh, the components of health he selects is different from what the previous selected, then you have a retrogress. Then comes the next thing. After the political parties have their manifesto, they have their own appointees. And these appointees who are chief executives, they also come with their own vision. And if that vision doesn't align throughout to what internationally is being looked at, then we drop out. But the most important thing has to do with the national agenda. The same thing with the international players. So this is another experience I shared. You might have an NGO in Ghana or a uh, uh, donor partner now they say we should call them implementing uh, the development partners. So uh, I'll give that to it. Now, the development partner will say, look, we want to deal, deal with uh, water and sanitation. And so he comes to Ministry of Health. He's looking at the same person goes to Ministry of uh, uh, Water and um, Housing, Work and Housing and Water Resources. Then they're developing a program. Then they say, so you find out that these programs that we are developing, health is doing something, another sector is doing something, they are not well coordinated and you have duplications. So you finally find a health facility that doesn't have water, you have housing that doesn't have water, but there's been water located uh, fi financing. So these are kind of some of the duplications we have because we tend to lose focus to, of our national agenda and we tend not to have enough money to be able to develop whatever we want as national, uh, in, within our national agenda. So uh, some of these things, do happen and they, they keep happening because they are all politically driven. If we understand it from that point of view, then I think that the first thing, just not to talk that much, would be that one, we will need to actually, each country will need to look half its national agenda well designed according to the amount of resources they generate. And so, okay, we want to develop our health sector or our health system gradually. This year, we can only do this, the next, this, the next. Because what we see frequently is a lot of agencies lose out. And even within the agencies, I thought Dr. Terry spoke up, the organizational structure of the agency can also let some players lose out. And they say, I can give you an example, like the National Protected uh, Processes and um, Autotic Center, which we develop uh, uh, the equipment for the disabled. You can be there the whole year, you might not get any funding for that. Because we need to keep reprioritizing all the needs because all the time you have less money than what you had planned for and you have to reprioritize and you have to fall on donor partners to assist. You have to fall on government. GOG is not that enough. GOG is government of Ghana releases is not enough. Then you just have a virtual cycle and then the next year you do the same program. Then you get less. So people also become a little bit demotivated because they keep doing the same thing, presenting the same documents. They don't have the funding to do that. And that, I, I, that can only be done if we look at it and say, look, it's all about domestication. 
we use our domestic resources. We agree we we'll spend some few years to get to where we want to get to, but that is how it will it will be. And countries like Tanzania, uh, I think, had achieved a little bit on that. And just to, that also leads to the last thing, which has to do with people and uh, their own attitude. When people don't have all the resources to work and they keep presenting plans, and then at the end of the day, they fight for the same resources, their attitude also changes and the culture becomes a mess where people can just become adamant to whatever plans and programs are being uh, executed. So I'll stop here in case there are questions because I can keep talking after uh, a lot of Thank experience. You. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Kaba. I think this is the best time to bring in um, our next speaker, um, Dr. Lee Abdul Fadil, who is a senior HIV advisor sitting in Sudan at the moment, I think. Um, over to you, madam. Um, I think your question has to do with how do you align as somebody who is working with a donor or development partner, how do you align your agendas with that of national agendas that you support, taking example from where you are and what are the politics involved in that? Let me start by thanking you and colleagues for having me today as part of this esteemed panel. And first, the most important thing is there's no global fund goals, full stop. We don't have goals at all. We are an innovative partnership that supports and funds national strategic goals and plans across HIV, TB, malaria, and what we call resilient, sustainable systems for health. And uh, what we call RSSH is basically the continuum of health and community um, systems, the entirety of it. And of course, more recently, COVID and pandemic preparedness. The global fund really depends on what we call country coordinating mechanisms. And in a way, they're national committees, and I'm sure in many um, of the colleagues joining this call, I hope they are sitting and or part of the country coordinating mechanism. And the country coordinating mechanism really makes decisions. It makes decisions on investments. It aligns those investments with the national strategic plans and make sure that they fund part of that um, in line with the domestic resource um, and funding and financing and other donor financing as well mainly whether it's PEPFAR or the US government um, and other uh, multilateral and bilateral donors as well. These investment decisions usually are followed by setting the implementation arrangements, as well as overseeing the supported national global fund grants or programs. So as you can see, the nas this national committee has a lot of power. It sets the direction and it follows and oversees the implementation of these global fund supported programs and we call them global fund supported programs because they are national programs that we kind of support in part along with the, with the national programs and the government domestic resources and other fin finances as well. So you can see that the country coordinating mechanism is central to our country and national ownership ethos, if you may. Our new strategy for 2023, 2028 is called fighting pandemics and building healthier and more equitable world. So it's, you, you can see all our commitments in the sentence. And one of the key changes in this strategy, which also follows from the current strategy and current implementation uh, from 20, 2017 to today, is building resilient, sustainable systems for health through investments that drive HIV TB programs, but also the health and the community components as well. And that includes co-infections, comorbidities. And we are really, this time around this time and, and next year, hopefully focusing to accelerate a shift from siloed programs to a much more integrated and people-centered model, whether it's for prevention, treatment, or care that ensures that individual health needs are met in a holistic approach. This strategy is of course in line with national strategies, but it's also in line with uh, um, uh, sustainable development goals, as well as COVID response and pandemic preparedness strategies as well. You can imagine the COVID response have really sparked an evolution of our country coordinating mechanisms. The country coordinating mechanisms in the past really looked at having ministries of health, people living with HIV, TB and malaria, civil society organizations, multilateral and bilateral partners, so WHO, UNAIDS, 
stop TB, roll back malaria, mm -hmm. other UN agencies, UNDP, and bilateral uh, um, donors as well, and development donors. So um, the UK, USA, French, Germany, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But with COVID, there there was a huge change to make sure that other players who were not at the table from the national stakeholders should be at the table. So individual, individuals are really um, focused on institutions that focus on pandemic preparedness, epidemic control and such to have really brought in to, to, to the table. Um, uh, for example, another example is WHO usually sits in all of these um, CCM meetings and, and CCM technical working groups. Um, however, for us, for us and for all of us as individuals to reach um, the, the sustainable development goals and national strategies, this evolution must continue, meaning that the people that are, sit around the CCM to make these decisions and oversee programs should continue to be more diverse. Let me give you specific examples. In our um, adolescent girls and young women programs, prevention treatment testing program, usually the Ministry of Education is missing. Um, the Minister of um, Social Services is missing. And these are partners that should be brought to the table and involved in decision-making, whether it's investment uh, decisions and or governance decisions as well. Um, all the list of the names, Gina, you have, you have mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. um, all, the, all the community leaders that Christopher mentioned, um, as, well as, as well as Dr. Kaba, should be there at the table making those decisions um, um, for Global Fund. But perhaps, and uh, the most important decision that the country coordinating mechanisms make is how much money is allocated for, mm -hmm. for um, health system strengthening. And it's one of the points, Dina, that, um, uh, Gina, that your research mentioned, the research you presented mentioned that funding is a very uh, important entry point for health systems thinking or system thinking. And um, that global fund um, uh, decision to allocate how much of the money to HSS is a very opportune moment to do that. Um, uh, later this year, around July, you will be seeing a lot of new guidance coming from the global fund around CCM, about um, financing and technical support to be provided to the CCM to support this evolution, but as, as well as technical guidance around resilient, sustainable systems for health. Um, if you allow me, the last point I will make is that over the past 20 years, the Global Fund has supported um, national programs and invested around 53 billion US dollars, saving over 44 million lives um, across the three diseases and other comorbidities as well, halving the death um, of people living with HIV, TB and malaria by half. This year, we're asking for $18 billion Mm. as a minimum, to continue to get uh, the world back on track to end HIV, TB, and malaria and build resilient, sustainable systems for health across the community continuum that we all need, uh, along with strengthening pandemic preparedness. Our campaign this year, as you can see behind me, has um, the logo or the, um, the, the, uh, the title, Let's Fight for What Counts. So I hope we're all fighting for, fight for what counts and I'm happy to take some questions at the end of the session. Over okay. to you, Gina. Okay, thank you very much for those insights. What is interesting is that <laughs> at each level, I think we've taken some comments from the district level, from the national, which Dr. Kaba has spoken about, and then also from the, uh, let's say, global perspective. And it seems like everybody thinks somebody is doing something, except nobody thinks anybody is doing something. So you have um, national level speakers thinking that, um, you know, they don't have the power. Yet you do, can you hear me? Um, yet you have um, district level leaders thinking, oh, national is not doing much to support and we are struggling managing this. You have global fund, uh, let me say global players thinking, okay, we are giving you the opportunity to make the decision, but then there they are thinking, okay, we don't have the power. So there is a bit of gap and I know this conversation is ongoing and I like the fact that there's, there is a change and I don't know whether to say thanks to COVID, a lot of these things have been brought up and is coming up in the discussions such as these are very, very important.
Um, there is one video from one of our panelists who couldn't join. If you don't mind, I'm going to share this video. It's a very short video um, so that you can also hear her perspective with regards to she is also a DG um, at um, a regional level. So uh, what we call, I think, provincial level, federal state level. So she, I will be sharing that video now, if you don't mind. Bear with me, it's only two minutes. Um, sure. Okay. So this, this is Dr. Emil Gesmala. She is also in Sudan and she has a lot to say with regards to how we should consider the health system. I'm going to make sure that uh, the voice, uh, you can hear the sound. So bear with me, let me so share sound. Okay, so I'm going to play that now. Um, okay, I don't even know how to play the video now. Um, where is play? I'm going to move this so I can see my icons. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for giving me the chance uh, to be part of this important session and to contribute. Uh, and I kindly ask you to mute your mic, please. About the health system in Sudan, which is a three-fire system, uh, including federal, the state, and local levels. Uh, the federal level is mainly responsible of setting directions. Uh, the national targets, uh, developing policies and strategies, uh, work on strengthening the coordination between the different uh, partners and uh, involved bodies, and work on resource mobilization. Uh, the other two levels are mainly the implementing levels where actually the services are provided. Uh, as you all know that the uh, healthcare services provision along with the strength in sustaining the health system is a very challenging process uh, and it includes many different actors as well uh, from inside and outside the health sector and the case is, 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 is the same in my country. Uh, we have so many uh, involved actors, uh, Minister of Health, Minister of Finance, Minister of Labour, and we have the regulatory bodies, uh, we have the health insurance and the growing private sector as well. And the issue is becoming more and more challenging when it comes to policy strategies implementation at the decentralized level, which is the local and the state level. Uh, either those policies um, will be properly implemented and that will result in positive effect and impact on the community health, improvement of the health uh, indicators, or they may be um, blocked at the front line uh, of the service delivery, like the hospitals or the communities themselves. In our case, the politics uh, involved in the relation between the national and the subnational levels is mainly around uh, the distribution of power and the authority over certain functions. And it's mainly around uh, how to connect the functions uh, operation at the state and local level with the national targets uh, to ensure that uh, we are all on the same page uh, to achieve the targets and the goals of um, the national level. And it's mainly around how the politics are mainly around uh, shaping the, the operations, uh, the implementation processes at those levels uh, to achieve the targets and those mainly around how the politics are mainly around uh, shaping the, the operations, uh, the implementation processes at those levels uh, to achieve the targets and those may differ um, based on the implementation capacity from state to state or even within one state from a locality to, a local, uh, to a, another locality and it's politics around how to avail the staff, how to manage them, how to motivate them, how to retain them, how to ensure that they have the capacities uh, to deliver the services with the quality expected and then uh, how to handle and to manage the resources, the budget available and then 
we have the issues around the political and administrative practices and setting at those uh, state and local levels, which may uh, shape the actors' uh, values, and their interests, and may affect their responses and their contributions. And finally, we have the politics around the community expectations, how to handle them, which may affect the acceptability and the utilization of the services uh, to be provided and how to align those expectations with uh, the priorities of the health systems at the local and the state level and with the national levels and to ensure that we are uh, using the resources properly uh, to address both. Uh, what we managed to do is to ensure that we have uh, a good leadership and management capacity at the decentralized levels to work on maintaining and the provision of the services with the quality and then uh, to encourage the innovation um, in addressing uh, the issues and, and handling and managing the functions for example at the local level we the, we provide a power and authority over recruiting and distribution to health uh, cadre at that level and to make uh, use and pro properly use uh, the staff and handling them and managing them to satisfy the community needs and then uh, we support the health and the local uh, the health system at the local and the state level to generate public value uh, through provision of services distributing the health care and to ensure effective and efficient use of the resources finally we built up a coordinatory platform uh, where the managers, the leaders from those two levels, they come together, they discuss the challenges, sharing experiences, uh, addressing uh, how they address the challenges and uh, how they come up with better arrangements for implementation to satisfy the national targets. I will stop here and uh, thank you again for giving me the chance to contribute. Gina, you are muted if you are speaking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for to Dr. Uh, Gizmala for her presentation, which she kindly sent to us earlier. Um, I think I'll ask one more question to uh, with regards to the facility. So we've had all these various levels where decision making are taking place, but at the facility where services are delivered. Um, Dr. Kaba, you and Dr. Chembe, I'll give you two minutes each. I know you love, you have so much experience and you love to share them, but I'll limit you to two minutes each to tell us what the reflections are with regards to the politics at the organizational facility level whether it is a small facility or a big facility. So we'll start with you, Dr. Kaba. Now, see if you can hear me, you are muted. Yeah, I, I can hear you, please. I was okay. trying to fix the pause. Uh, all right, so he, this is what happens. Uh, they, they usually say when a fish is rotten, it starts from the head. So whatever is at the national level or international level is what we get at the down at the bottom. Uh, if we don't have good integral collaboration at the top, we don't have it at the facility level because facilities must always communicate also with the community. Uh, we've developed this uh, scorecard system to, to see how the community evaluates us and to bring all the players within the surrounding facilities to support facilities. And then we realize that uh, the politics uh, when it draws into the facility level, it also dismantles or destroys the activities of health workers. So in short, what I would say is that in Ghana at this particular moment, the facility try to work hard, but at the same time, they are within the same bureaucratic chain of command. So if a facility needs something, it needs to rise to the next level for approval for another level to approve all the way to the ministerial level. That by itself um, kind of crashes the facilities. How the internal generative fund is used also um, has a problem, has a negative or positive impact on facilities, depending on who is looking at it. How leadership of facilities are appointed, if they are political appointees, they also come into the facilities with politics, which should be the case. So in and technically, this is how things 
start to roll out and we destroy the health system or we build it. Nonetheless, uh, just looking at it, COVID tried to give us the best way of doing system thinking and the best way of making things happen in a different way. But again, once uh, things settle, I mean, once COVID starts settling, people go back to their usual normal way of behaving. And then we forget that even if you leave a security man out, if he is sick, it can affect you. We forget that if you leave a mortuary worker out, if he falls sick, it can easily affect you. We go back to that regular, our own individualism set. And that is what happens at facility level. It has to start from the top, system thinking, and it will drill down all the way to the facility. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Christopher Chembe, can you please give us your two minutes thoughts on facilities? Th thank, you very, thank you very much. It, it's interesting that uh, we have the same experience which Dr. Kaba has given. And, and, and as, as Dr. Kaba was speaking, I was saying to myself to say, it's indeed a group of village. I think the experience with, which Dr. Kaba has given is the same kind of experience we are experiencing here in Botswana. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. I'm glad to note, and I want to acknowledge my MPA students who are online, both past and current, um, that you know some of the health systems challenges are very similar across board. So just to know that it may be in different contexts, but the challenges are real, especially within the broader context of the um, African region. Um, I'm going to hand over just by pointers because of time um, to, um, Dentle, who is going to tell us if there is anything to report on the polls, and then also to Ayat, who will be managing the. Uh, I think Dentle, you are managing the QA. So I'm handing over to you now, and um, please let us hear from those questions and um, that people have. I can see some hands up already. All right, I'm muting myself now. Dinkley, you are muted. <laughs> now I've caught on your, 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 your challenge, Tina. Well, thank you very much. Um, so I, I have since stopped the poll. I don't know if people are able to see the results of the poll um, on their screen. We only had about 57 response um, out of the um, those attending. We can see it. Okay, so we had about eight questions and, and in the interest of time, um, so that we don't close out people, we do have a couple of questions that I think um, we want Ayat to be able to just speak to some of them. Um, but I think just quickly from, from the poll, there is quite a lot of uh, responses that we got um, that, that really points to a number of people's own experiences in terms of um, dealing or engaging uh, with stakeholders in their day-to-day -day, uh, work activities. Um, but I think also just from the appreciation of the presentations that have been given by our panel members, many of us can really appreciate that none of us works in isolation. And because you do 